All right, good morning. This is EC42 Lecture 20. Today we're going to do pitch detection methods. Now, pitch detection is another one of these topics that's huge. Uh, there are a lot of different uh, pitch detection methods out there. Uh, if one of them really solved all the problems, you wouldn't see uh, so many of them and new ones coming up all the time. Uh, pitch detection is a little bit like uh, diet plans. Uh, you know, you always have this new diet plan every month of, uh, with great new promises, but in the end, uh, uh, there's a, uh, another diet plan a couple months later. So um, uh, why, why is this with pitch detection? Why is pitch detection so difficult? Uh, why, is it, uh, why isn't there just one way to do it that solves everything? Well, uh, one of the issues is there's a lot of different reasons to do pitch detection. Like one of the Things we saw in this class early on was a short window analysis. If you're going to do short window analysis, you want to know how to make a two-period window, how long that would be, and uh, so you need to pitch. Or you might want to do pitch shifting. I'll have an example here of pitch shifting uh, as a first example of a very simple pitch detection method. And um, that pitch uh, shifting will also be part of a homework topic. And then we also have uh, uh, tuning. Uh, if you want to tune an instrument, and the last example today will be a very good tuning uh, uh, algorithm, probably one of the best in the world, made by EC402 graduates. Uh, and uh, yeah, well, we'll see that. Uh, then uh, other reasons to do it might be harmonizing, other, other reasons, uh, sc uh, score following. So say you're doing a music minus one thing, so a, a student is playing a piece of music and you want the accompaniment to follow their tempo changes. Uh, so that's what score following would be. Many, many other reasons to do pitch shifting. Uh, I mean, sorry, to pitch detection. And they are all quite different from each other. For instance, in tuning, you have very long notes. And generally, when you tune an instrument, you play notes that are sustained for several seconds. Uh, so it doesn't have to be super fast, but it has to be super, super accurate. When uh, tuning instruments, people want to be accurate to fractions of cents. Um, for something like harmonizing, of course, it has to be real time. But in harmonizing, sometimes if you get octave errors or something, it's not so serious. Uh, some kinds of errors uh, don't matter so much. If you're uh, doing score following, uh, you might be able to deal with octave errors. If you're doing score printing, so somebody's playing something and you want to automatically create a musical score from that, well, then the octave errors are very serious. So there's many, many different reasons to do uh, pitch detection and many different requirements. Uh, there isn't really a, a one solution for everything. I do want to talk about some uh, pitch detection techniques that I have experience with uh, that pretty much give a, uh, a uh, sort of a snapshot of, of the different things that people do. So the first one here is a positive zero crossing detect. It says here, simple and unreliable uh, this is easy. In fact, the homework assignment is a very good paper. The Lent algorithm is a very good uh, sh uh, shifting algorithm, but uh, th th they also use this zero crossing detection. It's just really easy to do. Uh, there's many variations of this positive zero crossing detection. For instance, you could look for negative zero crossings, or you could look for uh, you could look for peaks or something. Uh, they all have uh, the same kinds of problems. So what is the issue here? Well, if you're doing a zero crossing detection, I get another sheet of paper here. Say you have uh, a uh, waveform that looks, I don't know, like this. And uh, if this is the, uh, if I'm sorry, that's not a very straight line, but if that were DC, uh, you could look at the positive zero crossings. This is one period, this is one period, and this is one period. So that's okay. Uh, you can see that if you just look for zero crossings, that might work. But what happens if there's noise in the signal or if this uh, harmonic here, whichever one's causing this bump here, is a little bit bigger? Then you might have an extra zero crossing here that you have to deal with. So it's inherently kind of unstable. If you already know the uh, frequency range that you're working in, uh, you can get it to work. And in fact, uh, like I say, this paper you're reading is a good paper. Uh, I would say a landmark paper, but it's uh, uh, it uses this uh, really kind of dumb algorithm. So what do you do here? For positive zero crossing detection, it's good to put a bandpass filter in front of it. 
uh, the bandpass filter, you want to get rid of DC because if you have too much DC, you're not getting, you know, the zero crossings are a problem. You also don't want to have strong harmonics beyond the fundamental because like I was just sketching, you might, if some higher harmonic uh, could cause additional zero crossings. So really, ideally, you have only one octave wide bandpass filter, uh, one that gets rid of the stuff below the lowest fundamental you'd want to get, uh, you're looking for, and uh, uh, cuts off before the highest fundamental you're looking for. Uh, in practice, you can go a little wider than an octave, maybe up to two octaves or so, and it'll uh, normally perform pretty well for lots of different sounds. I'm going to give an example here. But uh, basically, once you've found the zero crossings, then uh, you just uh, count the number of samples between the positive slope zero crossings. And uh, yeah, that gets you your period. You can do a little bit better than that. If I were to zoom in on a zero crossing here, say this were a, a sample, another sample, another sample, another sample, like this. This were your positive zero crossing, and this is the DC line. Well, you can tell here, to a fractional sample accurate, because if you only have frequency or the per pitch period accurate to integer samples, uh, for many applications, that's not accurate enough. Integer samples is a very rough estimate. Uh, but you can get a fractional sample uh, estimate by just looking at uh, it, doing a linear interpolation here and, and uh, guessing, okay, how many fractional samples over is that? So you might be able to figure out, yes, this period is 99.37 samples long, and a pretty good effort, or at least 99.4, uh, you might be able to get a tenth of a sample or better accuracy there. So that's uh, the zero crossing detection. I'm gonna show uh, an example. I'm gonna play this piece of music. Um, this is recorded without reverb, so it, uh, yeah, it sounds a bit dry, but uh, uh, for this experiment that I did with Ed Egan um, for the uh, pitch detection that's, uh, uh, sort of a simple zero crossing pitch detection that's built into the continuum um, pitch detection sound. Here we go. This was uh, his original singing. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. So please don't take my sunshine away. So we did this, uh, you know, we were just experimenting with this zero crossing pitch detector. Uh, uh, this is just the bug output that I had. So it's, it's a little bit um, suboptimal, but uh, this on here is a period number. So that horizontal axis isn't really quite time because lower pitches, uh, the period is actually more time than the higher pitches, but it, it doesn't matter so much. Um, the thing you can look at here is uh, we picked this melody uh, because, well, it doesn't have a very big pitch range, but there's things we didn't expect or didn't think about. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, some of the problems that came up here uh, remember, the pitch range is limited because this bandpass filter is limited to an octave or a little over an octave. Otherwise, you get harmonics and you get false uh, zero crossings. Um, so, uh, so, so the bandpass filter, is, its idea is to get rid of the harmonics so you only have a single per, zero crossing per filter, uh, per period. But it turns out our pitch range here is much higher. For this Y uh, gliss, as I labeled it here, uh, it turns out when you say, uh, or when you sing U, the pitch changes from much lower than the, what you would have as a notated pitch on a, on a sheet music. Um, you have this long glissando over uh, many more half steps than I had expected. Uh, it happens over here again, too. Uh, so that makes the pitch range wider than, than expected. And um, the uh, glissando there is like almost an octave. Uh, there in, in pitch. So that, that's a lot wider uh, pitch detection you need because even though the, what you're thinking of, the, the, the notes you're singing are uh, more limited in pitch range. Uh, here, this vertical axis is in uh, note numbers. Um, it, the, yeah, it is, we didn't expect this, this extra octave of range or nearly extra octave of range. Uh, so we stretched our bandpass filter, but it, it seemed to work okay. 
uh, there were other uh, things that were uh, happened, like at the um, the embers we have here. Uh, so this first one here, this is a each uh, uh, period, just uh, uh, what the pitch was that we found for each period. Then uh, this one, uh, uh, the zero crossing algorithm, uh, this is just uh, peak amplitude. And what you have is in places where you don't really expect a very high peak amplitude, uh, there's huge ones like for the M of my. So uh, that's sort of this M burst, as I called it, happened several times. And uh, yeah, that's problematic because normally when you have high amplitude, uh, we were using that to make a voiced unvoiced decision. Uh, when, for instance, in S, uh, I can't show it here, for the S, uh, you have to look on your sheet to see it all at once, I guess. But for the S in sunshine, uh, that's a very broad band, and uh, peak amplitude's very low. Uh, and SH has the same thing. For the breath, it's the same thing. You have uh, uh, very low amplitudes indicate unvoiced, and that's important for a pitch shifting algorithm because, uh, well, we wanted to pitch detect on this and then pitch shift it uh, by um, Ed playing on the continuum. Uh, it was sort of an, an interesting experiment because normally if you use like Melodyne or some good pitch shifter, you can correct pitches or you can change pitches in what somebody is singing, but the micro variations of their voice are retained. You don't want to get rid of all the micro variations, otherwise it'll sound kind of robotic. Uh, what we are, so when, when you, uh, uh, it's like you're sort of changing the overall DC of the pitch for a note, but the, the little variations during that note, you generally don't change, or at least you change them separately. You might want to uh, increase or decrease vibrato, but that's separate from uh, uh, shifting the pitch. Um, so uh, here, what we wanted to do is on the continuum, we want to see, well, what happens if you try to do the microstructure all with your finger? So you really uh, uh, just pitch shift exactly according to your finger and ignore what was previously in there, just, well, what would it sound like? What could you do with that? So uh, we wanted a no voiced unvoiced decision because for pitch shifting, that's super important. When you have unvoiced like shh or s, that doesn't depend on what pitch you're singing. That shouldn't be shifted around. It'll sound funny if you do that. Uh, on the other hand, if it is a voice like an ah or an ooh, uh, then you do want to shift it. Here, like I say, these embers were problems for us because uh, you had this very high peak, uh, which uh, confused the algorithm that was trying to figure out, is this voice, you know, do I have a, am I confident of my pitch or not? Uh, all very simple algorithms, of course. Um, all right, so then also this, uh, this idea, even under the best of circumstances, every once in a while, uh, you do have something that's above this zero line uh, that we had uh, uh, set here for determining if something is voiced or unvoiced. So, um, yeah, uh, lots of little problems, but it worked uh, It worked pretty well. It was kind of cute. I'm going to play you some audio examples of just messing around with this. As I say, this is by no means a world-class uh, pitch detection. Uh, it's just a... Uh, simple sort of implementation, a real-time implementation of the same kind of algorithm uh, that you have in the homework of the uh, 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 Lent algorithm. So, I'll play the original again, and then I'll play it monotonized. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. So please don't take my sunshine away. So as an you are my whoa. sunshine. So as an in-between thing, now we do this monotone thing. Uh, uh, so we pitch shift everything uh, just to one pitch, just to see uh, well that the algorithm is working. And also uh, internally, the algorithm ended up working this way, where you sort of have this idea of take the original. 
pitch shift to the standard pitch and then shift it to wherever the fingers are on the fingerboard. So this is the monotone version. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. So please don't take my sunshine away. Yeah, so uh, that's pretty much all one you pitch. It sounds are my uh, sunshine, no, no, my. Um, uh, that's a. Uh, uh, a uh, pretty good rendition. Uh, you, you can uh, uh, listen to the files I emailed to you if this qu sound quality here on YouTube isn't good enough. But it's a pretty good rendition, and uh, the breaths and even the whys and stuff are shifted pretty well um, uh, to one pitch. But I have to say, this was with some fiddling around with parameters. Uh, as you, If you do try the pitch shifting sound in, in the uh, continuum, uh, you will see that, yeah, you can set a lower limit, an upper limit for the bandpass filter, and you sort of fiddle around with parameters a bit until it works for the example you're working on. Um, so now I'm going to just play the lead line. Uh, so what happens now is instead of just playing a mon uh, monotone like this, it gets, uh, the uh, pitches get shift, all, well, all of the uh, phrase or all of the melody uh, gets shifted to wherever the uh, uh, finger is on the fingerboard. So this is just the lead line now with pitch from finger and uh, the rest of it from voice. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I So if you listen that closely, it's kind of interesting because uh, the details are certainly not the same as the singer would actually do or not the same as the original, but uh, it has its own kind of, uh, I don't know what, foreign beauty in, its, uh, in, its, uh, uh, in that kind of rendition. Here's the same thing with um, uh, uh, just several layers. So uh, doing that several times, fingers in different positions on the fingerboard so that you uh, get this. You are my sunshine, also some reverb. My only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. So please don't take my sunshine. And here's another example, um, slightly different uh, parts and melody. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love. So, please don't take my sunshine away. All right. So, uh, yeah, that was kind of fun. Uh, now, there are certainly um, other and better pitch shifting algorithms than this, and I want to get into some of those. Uh, the next one I want to do here is a comb filter uh, pitch detection and autocorrelation. Uh, they're very closely related. Uh, these, beth these methods are better than zero crossings for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, as I go on here, I'm going to um, have methods that are better and better. But again, zero crossing is probably the most common one used just because you can get a fast start. And uh, <laughs> once you've got it working, you're always fiddling with it. But, uh, uh, you know, it is something easy to program uh, that gets you a fast start. 
so here's slightly more complicated ones. Uh, this first one is from the 1980s from Gary Switkovitz and myself. Uh, Gary Switkovitz actually built hardware to do this as uh, part of his master's degree way back then. Um, computers weren't quite fast enough. But uh, we were using this uh, to teach singing. <laughs> uh, it's uh, somewhat embarrassing even so many years later, but uh, we'd taken these introductory music classes, and by far the worst thing about it was having to sing uh, in front of the class. I mean, it's bad enough to have a terrible voice, but to also be singing out of tune is, is just horrible. So we were on the Plato system, which is a, a early forerunner of the internet, and uh, uh, since it's a teaching system, we wanted to teach people maybe not how to sing beautifully, but at least how to sing in tune. And uh, so that's what this was born from. So what is this here? A comb filter. Uh, what is that method? Well, you want to have an intuitive idea of this equation here, this f of delta t. All this really is, uh, is uh, you take the sample of the sound, um, the, the, the sample of the waveform um, at some time delta, uh, delta t ahead minus the sample at time t. Okay, and take the absolute value of that difference. So what is that? You're just taking, if delta t were equal to one period, right, then you get a minimum here. Certainly if delta t is zero, you get zero in the sum. Um, but if delta t is one period away, that's going to get you as close to zero uh, as you could hope for, because the waveform is most similar to itself, it's most self-similar um, when delta t... Uh, well, one period away, when delta t equals one period. So that's what this f of delta t is. Uh, go ahead and uh, just think about this for a while. Uh, if the equation makes no intuitive sense, stop the video and think about it, since you can't ask me uh, in real time. Uh, think about it and make sure that this equation makes sense, because it's really not that complicated. I just don't want it to be going over your head. All right, so... Uh, then um, S of T here, this is a picture. Actually, this is a screen image from the very first flat panels back uh, probably even when you were young. Uh, the biggest part of a computer was a vacuum tube for the display. And uh, the beginning of the end of that was at the U of I at, uh, with inventions of plasma, uh, flat panel displays, plasma panels, and then what later grew out of them as um, <coughs> LCD panels. But um, uh, this is a ancient, ancient, uh, screen print uh, of a waveform. So this is just S of t over time here. And if you look at what does f of delta t look like, well, it gets to zeros here around three, and that turns out to be about a period, right? Because if you substitute whatever that distance there is, uh, three milliseconds, um, a little, uh, little over three milliseconds, that's the period of the sound. That's when f of delta t is going to give you something closest to zero. Then you also have some other wiggles in f of delta t. Those are used due to the harmonics and various other aspects of the sound. But these minima tend to be um, at periods. The minima aren't all the same depth because, again, uh, we always see this, the, the way that the uh, sampling interval lines up with the waveform you're playing makes a difference. Sometimes one period away is a minimum, and then it's nice, like here, where two periods away, it's a little less minimum. Three periods away, it's a little less minimum. Sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes two periods away, it's a little bit lower than one period away. It really just depends on how you line up with sample rate on the S of T. But you have this function here. Now, uh, when does this go wrong? Every algorithm has its problems. Well, we were working on this, uh, I guess it says here, in 1983 is when these images are from. But uh, what happens when you have a sound where the second harmonic is much louder than the fundamental? Uh, there's many such examples. Uh, the extreme one uh, uh, you saw the other day was a muted trombone, where, where a higher harmonic is much, much stronger than all the rest. But in any case here, uh, it's not uncommon that the fundamental frequency is, is overshadowed by a higher harmonic, it is not as, uh, not as loud as a higher harmonic. And then you end up with a f of delta t that ends up looking like this, where you have a sort of this rounded peak at the um, harmonic, and then you have a, 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 a pointy peak, and, uh, or uh, I'm sorry, minimum. These are minima. Uh, you have a rounded minimum, then a pointy minimum, and then a rounded minimum, pointy minimum. This isn't uh, uh, very accurately drawn here, but this pointy one 
turns out just by experience, we saw, wait, the pointy ones really are the period. And the rounded ones sometimes are even lower than the pointy ones, but those are due to some very strong harmonic. So that's where at the very beginning here, instead of just looking for minima of f of delta t, we look at for maximum pointiness. Uh, max, uh, so you, you uh, find the uh, uh, pointiest places and that corresponds to a pitch period. So what about this algorithm though? If you want to, uh, if you don't know what delta t is, right, you have to compute this sum here for different delta t's. And so one problem with this algorithm and the next algorithm, the autocorrelation, is that you have to, uh, it takes quite a bit of computation because you're hunting around for what are the possible delta t's. And if you start with the uh, smallest possible period you have and uh, want to go to the uh, largest possible period you have, if you have a four octave range or something, this is a lot of sums you have to compute, a lot of different delta t values you have to look at to find the minimum. And we had various ways of trying to search, you know, hill climbing equivalents of uh, uh, trying to search uh, uh, for uh, the best delta t, but uh, it, is, it is a bit problematic. Um, the same problem occurs in autocorrelation pitch detection, which is commonly used uh, nowadays and is actually very, very similar to what we were doing in the 1980s. Um, so autocorrelation, you find a delta t that maximizes this equation. Now, instead of having absolute value of a difference, it's got a sum of these multiplies. But multiply and add on, especially on DSP processor, on digital signal processor, multiply and add is a single instruction, where it turns out, even though really in some sense it's much more complicated to do a multiply than to just to do a subtract, as we were doing previously, uh, unless you're implementing this yourself on an FPGA or something, uh, where you don't already have a multiply, uh, in general, this is actually much more expensive. It takes maybe three times as long as doing uh, the multiply and add on a modern DSP. So that's why this autocorrelation algorithm, very similar to the previous algorithm, and in a sense more complicated, but for modern DSP architectures, more efficient to actually implement is um, autocorrelation. You have the same thing here. Um, here are pictures that... Uh, 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 from uh, UCL uh, in the UK. And uh, you see here, um, yeah, uh, uh, you see the uh, autocorrelation auto function here. You can see that at peaks, as you get more periods away, it's this changing waveform. And unless alignment with the uh, sample rate is a very strong effect, what you expect happens here as you see in this image, where as you get farther away from the actual period, as you get two periods or three periods, the peaks are, are uh, decreasing in size. So this is the autocorrelation, and that's the original waveform. And again, from this, you can tell um, delta t. Do notice that the time scales are different on these two here. Um, so uh, here you're maximizing f of delta t, but uh, you have the same problems as with the comb uh, filter approach. You get octave errors, harmonic errors. Uh, they're hard to, a little bit fiddly to, to, to get rid of. Uh, you can do it over many more octaves and you can do zero crossing. So it's better than zero crossing, but it still has this problem. And it's challenging to, to reduce computation. So um, yeah, so, so while uh, both of these are pretty much equivalent methods in my uh, experience, uh, this one would be more efficient to implement. I'd like to uh, introduce you to a yet better one, though, uh, which I would strongly suggest you use. In fact, I had a uh, student in our class, uh, uh, who a uh, brilliant student who went on to ma make uh, some of the best uh, violin teaching software out there um, that exists uh, at this time. Uh, so he was an EC402, and he had this pitch detection problem. And he needed something that was robust, that could do... Um, that could really tell what is the student playing, um, could do uh, high quality s uh, score following and other sort of things uh, to evaluate the uh, students uh, playing. So uh, uh, better than uh, the autocorrelation for a variety of reasons um, is this Kepstro pitch detection. And I'll get into reasons why it's better. Uh, it's uh, in fact, as sort of a core technique for sounds that are quasi-harmonic, that are close to harmonic, I would say this is your go-to technique. So, 
let's first talk about Kepstrom. For those of you who are not uh, familiar with a Kepstrom, you know what a spectrum is? Well, Kepstrom is just a spectrum with letters rearranged. Uh, Noel and his buddies must have uh, had a good drinking party and, and come up with these funny names, um, and they stuck. So um, uh, spectrum uh, turns into Kepstrom uh, with this kind of analysis, and then frequency, uh, they rearrange letters to make frequency. And, uh, well, you'll see what that is in just a second. But if you look at this equation here, and just stop and uh, stare at it for a while, figure it out, the capital X here, well, that's a Fourier transform of your original signal. So these capsule coefficients, as they're called, Cx of n, um, uh, this inner part here is a Fourier transform of your original signal. And if you didn't have this log magnitude thing in here, this would just be a Fourier transform of a Fourier transform. And as you know, or just think about, what happens if you do an FFT, and then you take the data, your complex data, and do an FFT again? What do you get? Well, an FFT, as you know, is its own inverse, right? The second FFT just gets you your samples back again. Uh, you might have some scaling and offset issues there, but basically uh, it's its own inverse. So this is not the same as doing an FFT of an FFT because you take log magnitude in here. We'll talk about various intuitive reasons why this log magnitude makes sense uh, and why it's good, but be careful here. This is log magnitude, right? So what does that mean? If you took an FFT of an FFT, well, this X, this capital X here is an FFT of your original signal, and it's complex. By the time you take log magnitude, of course, you have only a real signal. So you're taking FFT of a log magnitude of an FFT, and that's very different than the original samples that we call the Kepstrom. So we're going to go through this example here. Um, here's some waveform, and uh, this is uh, the waveform after you window a little part of it. And then this is the log, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, this is the magnitude spectrum of that waveform. This is the magnitude. So remember that the capital X of e, uh, J omega is uh, complex, of course, but we're just drawing the magnitude spectrum, okay? So, uh, and in fact, when we take our next FFT, we're going to, well, do the log magnitude spectrum. But let, let's just stop here for a second. When we look at this magnitude spectrum, there's several things we want to do, uh, look at. First of all, you can kind of see this overall shape of this thing is kind of like this. That's the spectral envelope that I uh, uh, penciled in there, right? You can see the spectral envelope. That's just sort of the um, overall uh, shape of where the resonances are, where, where, you know, where the peaks are in your spectrum. That's great. Then if you look at where the fundamental is, well, look, the fundamental is this dude here. But of course, this peak, the biggest peak in your magnitude spectrum is the third harmonic. It's not the fundamental. So it's extremely important uh, uh, to realize that, hey, you can't just take magnitude spectrum, pick out the peak and think that's a fundamental. Uh, that's a very, very poor way of doing things. And there's really two reasons why it's poor. One of them is, well, the peak isn't, <laughs> isn't the fundamental. Uh, but it, it's even worse than that. Um, even if you do find a proper fundamental and say, okay, well, this determines the frequency, that's a very inaccurate frequency. Like if you take the peak sample there and you say, okay, well, that tells me uh, the frequency, uh, you're going to get a very, very approximate frequency due to... Um, all sorts of reasons, but the first one is just you're taking one data point out of this whole thing. And that's just a very poor approach to things. Like we've seen in so many other places, uh, if you can take a global approach instead of a local approach, we've seen that in the time frequency reassignment. We've seen that even in the AI paper about analyzing um, uh, music, uh, a a analyzing MIDI files, uh, music playing to get uh, uh, the uh, uh, timing and, and uh and accidentals um, in the music, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and, and all those things, if you can do something global, you're always better off. So the thing to notice here is, look, don't look at this one point to figure out pitch. What you want to do is like, look at this here. If you just uh, look at all these harmonics, they're equally spaced, right? So forget the fact that this even came from a Fourier transform, a magnitude Fourier transform. Let's just say this was your input signal 
and you wanted to find its frequency. Well, these things are equally spaced, right? So how do you find the frequency of a real signal? This is a real signal, after all. Let's forget where it came from. This is a real signal. It's magnitude um, uh, uh, of the transform. So it's a real signal. And if you take an FFT of that real signal, then you're really using all these data points. You're finding information on what is the spacing between all these, and that will tell you a much better uh, idea of what the original frequency was. To go on beyond that, though, uh, if you take the log magnitude spectrum, uh, there's different ways to think of the log here. But one really simple thing to think about is log brings out the quieter harmonics. Look at this thing here. Right, this is, uh, uh, th these get really quiet, that one's really big. Really, well, all you're interested in when you take the Fourier transform of this is you want to see how evenly spaced these guys are. You, you know, what's the spacing between this? What's basically, what's the period of the spectrum, which doesn't make a lot of sense. But uh, yeah, you want to see how, how far apart are those. So if you take the log, look how much better this looks. All of these tiny little guys here look quite clear. Up here, meh. Doesn't, it's not going to do much. But hey, um, uh, down down here, you have a nice repeated, much, much clearer repeating signal. And as you know, when you do a Fourier transform, if you have a repeating signal, you'll get a clearer peak. So that's one way to interpret the log magnitude. Uh, why would you take log? Another thing is that um, you've got this issue here that you have the spectral envelope, or one way to think of this thing here is a spectral envelope imposed on an impulse train. So you don't really have an well. This uh, so these are all different heights because the spectral envelope is imposed on it by doing the log magnitude here. When you take the FFT, it gets you an additive relationship between the components that are uh, the uh, 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 after, after you take the when you take this log magnitude here, you're going to get as I show down here. Um, uh, this additive relationship where the low spectral um, uh, uh, kepstral components here, uh, the slow kepstral, uh, the low kepstral numbers are going to give you information on this uh, uh, on the spec uh, on the uh, spectral envelope, and then this peak here really is just due the highest peak there is going to be due to the equal spacing of all these guys, um, namely that's. Uh, the period of your input signal. Do keep in mind that Q-frequency here, that that's what we call this uh, kepstrom of the signal. Once you take the FFT of the log magnitude, you got the Q-frequency, and the Q-frequency, these units here are in samples, right? Because if you look at the units here, you always, uh, yeah, the relationship is, is, you're back in sample units, so this peak here is telling you what the period of the signal is. In this case here, we have a peak uh, at Q-frequency 65, which means the signal's period is 65. And you can check that out. You can do linear interpolation or um, uh, even a, a fancier thing like Smith interpolation and uh, get a better uh, accuracy than uh, uh, just a one sample there. But uh, this is a very solid way to do uh, detection. So what you'll want to do if you actually want to implement this is first of all, you need an FFT routine. But boy, FFTs are available. Every DSP has FFTs available in optimized form. And uh, uh, doing two FFTs uh, and a log magnitude in between is really not a lot of work. Um, you do have to be careful that the lowest components here sometimes can be quite large. Uh, here, only the DC one, I think, is large. But in any case, these can be quite large, and they have to do with the spectral envelope. Ignore those. So you have to know sort of what's uh, the minimum pitch period you would ever have, or the highest pitch, and um, uh, those uh, uh, then only look for the peak, for the highest peak um, after that point. Ignore the stuff on the left if you're looking for uh, the pitch period. Okay. So again, know why this is more accurate than looking at the fundamental peak, than just looking at this. It's because it takes all this data into account. It's much more global uh, kind of operation. All right. So this, I would say, is as a really good core technique. There are some situations where you don't want to use an FFT. And I just want to point this out in case uh, uh, you run into this. Um, one problem with an FFT is if you're doing something in real time, 
in order to do an FFT, you need some number of samples. Say you're waiting for, uh, I don't know, 1,024 samples. Well, that means your algorithm is going to have a 1,024 sample delay. Not because the FFT takes very much time to compute, that's really fast, but you have to wait for all the samples to come in from your A to D converter before you can do an FFT on them. So there's all sorts of tricks you can do about having sh uh, shorter FFTs when possible, or sometimes computing shorter and longer ones and de de deciding on them uh, in order to get fast response. Uh, but your issue is that if you have a wide frequency range from very low frequencies to very high frequencies, well, the FFT length you need for the lowest frequencies is quite long, quite many samples. So you have to, you might have to implement some tricks in order to make it fast and responsive for high frequency things. Um, in any case, very solid technique. Check out Trala sometime online just uh, for the heck of it to see what your uh, co-students have come up with. Here's another um, cool uh, algorithm. Uh, which is close to my heart because it uses reassignment. And those, again, these are um, 402 graduates. This is uh, uh, not a teaching product, This is, or, or at least not primarily, it's a tuner. Uh, so their product is called AP Tuner. And uh, yes, so what is this about? Well, as you know from our uh, lecture, uh, from, from one of the previous lectures uh, when we are talking about tunings, uh, not all instruments are quasi-harmonic, and even instruments where you would expect it. For instance, in piano, it, for uh, the lower end of the frequency range, if you play loud, low notes, you get very non-harmonic frequencies. And we've talked about that in more detail in previous lectures, um, but uh, how do you analyze that? This Kepstrel technique that we were just looking at, uh, where you try to find the peak Q frequency, well, that's not gonna work for something um, if it's too non-harmonic, if, if, uh, you know, if the higher harmonics go sharper and sharper, like they do in piano, low notes that are played loudly, well, uh, you just don't get an evenly enough spaced enough spectrum, right? Uh, for the Q frequency to mean anything for, for, for the computation to work out, you need a repeating, you, you need the FFT of this well, it's assuming to get that peak that these are equally spaced or nearly equally spaced harmonics. And if they're uh, far from that, if they're uh, uh, increasing spacing harmonics, uh, like they would be on low piano note, uh, that's problematic. For this AP tuner, since the biggest instruments in the world are uh, uh, acoustic guitar and acoustic piano, uh, the AP tuner uh, is, as far as I know, the only tuner out there, uh, even today still, uh, where you don't have to twist knobs or anything. You can automatically uh, analyze anything, uh, even loud low notes on the piano. So how does this work? Well, the idea here is that all the methods so far have assumed equally spaced harmonics, uh, or, or close to equally spaced. If they're close, it's going to be good enough. Um, where Fn, or, or the uh, nth partials, n times the fundamental. By the way, uh, you'll see confusion here because uh, uh, the various papers count the partials differently. Some of them start counting at zero, the same equation. If you call the fundamental F0, then it's this um, equation. You have to do an n plus one in there. Uh, but if, uh, if you start counting at one, as is convenient here, um, and is done in, in, this, uh, in this equation here, uh, then you don't need that plus one. So what is this here? Well, uh, for round strings, the uh, this is a, a good approximation formula for inharmonicity of wound strings. So when you're playing that loud low note on a piano, the nth harmonic is n times the fundamental. And that would be the end of things if we're harmonic, right? Uh, if it's the seventh harmonic, it would just be seven times fundamental frequency. If it were the 35th harmonic, it would be 35 times the fundamental frequency. But you have this extra square root term here which is one plus bn squared. And so what is that? Well, if n equals one is a fundamental, then uh, and b is zero, then you have an exactly harmonic sign. But b is an inharmonicity value, okay? And usually it's something like 0 0.0001. Doesn't seem like much. But by the time you get, say you're playing a low piano, oh boy, the hundredth, uh, you can easily hear 100 harmonics on the lowest notes in the piano, and by the time you have 100 time, uh, uh, B times 100 squared, 
that's huge, right? So even though this inharmonicity seems like a small number, because it's multiplied by harmonic number squared, uh, or partial number squared, I should say, um, the inharmonicity, uh, you end up making a big variation in frequency. So uh, uh, this is a very big effect. And uh, yeah, so this is a nice approximation formula, though we have this nice formula, we might as well use it. And uh, yeah, so we've seen values as big as 0.01 or so. So uh, the harmonic spacing is increasing by the uh, by the partial number squared, uh, right? It's even funny called harmonic spacing. Maybe we should call it partial spacing. And so uh, what is the 16th harmonic or the 16th partial of the low note on the piano? It's 27.5 hertz. Well, ideally it's 440 hertz, the 16th one. But you got B times 16 squared uh, in this formula. So uh, depending on what B is, and B is a ugly monster because it depends, it, this is a fairly simple formula here, and depending on how loud you play the low note, you get a different B. So uh, it's not like there's one B for the whole piano or one B for even one note on the piano. Uh, uh, this B varies with uh, how loud you're playing. So how does this work? What happens here? So pitch detection by spectral peak labeling and time frequency reassignment. So time frequency reassignment um, is, uh, is cool. We talked about that. That, that helps you uh, keep a shorter FFT uh, and, uh, well, rather than in increasing frequency accuracy by doing longer FFTs, we have the reassignment techniques. Uh, so we talked about that in a previous lecture. Um, but, uh, as, so say we had... Uh, um, our reassigned spectrum. So we have nice, accurate uh, frequency peaks in the spectrum, and uh, you know, we, we know the magnitudes well and that sort of thing. Then what do we do? Well, these peaks won't be equally spaced. So what you do is you just take those peaks and you find the best fit to the above formula. So you try to say, well, if we assume that uh, this peak here is the fundamental, uh, then how much of the energy of the sound can we capture with different, you know, with an optimized value of B. So how many of the other peaks, given the B, could you label as a second harmonic, third harmonic, fourth harmonic, and so forth? So it's just fitting to this formula, uh, uh, fi finding the best fit that accounts for most of the energy and most of the peaks in the spectrum. And uh, here's a typical analysis. You can get this, I believe the Windows version is still available uh, for free if you buy it on the App Store for your phone. I think it costs the big whopping five bucks, but uh, I don't think the phone version draws these graphs. Might be a little hard to see here in this uh, in this video. But in any case, uh, what is going on here? Well, the uh, fundamental here, which would be called F1 here, I called it F0 here, sorry about the discrepancy. Uh, this is the fundamental. And then you see these various harmonics, how, um, or various partials. This is showing for each partial, how many cents sharp is it? So from the pitch that we said that the algorithm said the sound was, the fundamental is like uh, 13 cents flat. And then uh, uh, the, the uh, next partial, next partial, next partial, getting closer to the pitch. And then uh, they keep going sharp and sharp. They go sway, crazy sharp. Uh, 16th partial, so like this is low A, uh, the 16th partial is uh, 65 cents sharp. So it's way, way sharp from what you would expect uh, that... A to B, and as you remember, we talked about doing stretch tunings and such uh, for that reason uh, in a previous lecture. But this thing is able to figure out uh, for each partial, that's what's shown here, for each partial uh, or each peak, um, uh, uh, how much sharper uh, flat is it and then it takes a weighted average of all those flatness and sharpness values, uh, a weighted average by the energy in each uh, in each partial to get you the overall perceived pitch, and it's pretty good. I mean, this is not an exact simulation of what a human does, but yeah, it's a, you know what you're hearing when you hear that low piano note is actually not any of the energy that might be present at the fundamental. There's not a whole lot of energy 
at, the, at least at the very lowest notes, there's not a whole lot of energy at the fundamental anyway, but the pitch that you perceive is sort of uh, an average of the um, uh, sense offset of all of these different uh, uh, harmonics. So it's sharp of the fundamental, uh, which is something I wanted to talk about too. Uh, so uh, there's different kinds of uh, detection we can do. You can do an F0 detect, which just tells you what is the fundamental frequency. That, that would be this guy down here. Um, or pitch detect, which uh, for a sound like this is different than the fundamental. This is what is a perceived frequency. What's a good guess at what is a human here when they listen to this? Then there's other things too, like strike notes. Well, for percussion, like bells, uh, orchestral bells and various other sounds, um, uh, various other percussion instruments, there, there's a lot of different kinds of tuned percussion. And for that tuned percussion, experienced musicians will tell you what pitch they're at and can hear it. They can hear it quite accurately. But what's odd about it is that if you were to record the sound or listen to it as an uninitiated, that pitch that they say, oh, that's an F sharp or that's whatever it is, actually lasts for a very short part of the sound. And that's called the strike note, or that's the... Um, after, when you strike the instrument, um, that's the pitch you hear. And even though it doesn't last real long, that's the pitch that you think about and assign to that note uh, when you're listening to music. So if you want to do uh, pitch detection for a percussion instrument like that, uh, then again, you, you might want to detect a strike note. Uh, again, a very complicated thing. And that's actually something that I don't believe is implemented in this particular AP tuner algorithm. All right, uh, that's what I've got for uh, uh, pitch detection now. And uh, thank you very much. I'll uh, see you next time.